Joining me now, David Bonson, the Bonson Group founder and CIO and crisis of responsibility author, Harry Kazianis, Center for the National Interest Defense Studies Director, Bob Cusack is with us, Hill Editor-in-Chief, and also with us, Fort O'Connell Civic Forum PAC Chairman. Harry, let me start with you. Um, China made some pretty good overtures here. And uh, by the way, South Korea also made some major concessions with respect to trade. Where do you see this all going? Well, Charles, I think today the markets finally woke up to what I think a lot of us have been saying for a long time. There was never going to be a trade war with China in the first place. Let's face it, the United States, despite what the, what the pundit class tells you, is still the most dominant economic power in the world. It's worth $19 trillion. The Chinese economy, only worth $11 trillion. So we're in the driver's seat when it comes to trade. And I think that's today why you saw the market just start to boom. And I think the Chinese realized that they're not in a good position when it comes to these different trade disputes. And let's face it, the Chinese have been cheating on trade for years. It is completely unfair that a U.S. company, if it wants to do business in China, has to literally hand over its intellectual property and form a joint venture. So I think the Chinese made probably the prudent decision here. You know, Ford, uh, obviously uh, there's a lot to lose, uh, a lot, lot is at stake. At a time when the global economy is doing extraordinarily well, China with grand ambitions uh, from fortifying mainman, uh, man-man islands to the new Silk Road, and uh, with GDP, with debt at 250 percent of GDP, it's a delicate balancing act for everyone involved. Uh, it absolutely is a delicate balance, but I do agree with David. Look, Tr President Trump holds or, the high or, cards. Or Harry. Here. Well, Harry, he, he, President Trump holds the high cards here, and he's willing to fight. I think what President Trump is looking for is for China to basically, you know, cut off a large portion of that $375 billion trade deficit. I think they'd also like to see U.S. companies not be forced to turn over their technology. And I think that what else is missing here is what we forget is not only is the U.S. a larger economy, but really China's on the verge of a debt crisis itself, and it's become increasingly dependent on U.S. markets. Just look at the merchandise trade surplus. Two years ago was 68 percent of China's merchandise trade. Now it's 88 percent. China cannot live without the U.S. because right now their biggest key is investment, not consumption. Of course, David, uh, with both sides, uh, leaders on both sides are going to want to, quote unquote, save face. So uh, from here, how do you see it playing out? Oh, I have no question that one way or the other, President Trump will save face here. Um, I very much question the substance of what concessions he's going to end up getting. I agree with what the other guests have alluded to in the fact that there are things that need to get done, and I think that we will move the ball to some degree around intellectual property. I don't agree fundamentally with the idea that the trade deficit is in and of itself a uh, problem, and we can't really have it both ways. If we want China's dependency on our investment markets, that trade deficit is where the dollars come from that come back into our country. So you, you, we can't have all of these things at once. Ultimately, I believe that it will get better, but I think it will get better with a lot less movement than anybody's pretending. We saw it with the steel and aluminum thing, Charles, over the last month. At the end of the day, virtually everybody's been excluded. We kind of had a big much ado about nothing. I think it was a great photo op for the president, but from a posturing standpoint, the president's on the right track with deregulation, was on a brilliant track with tax reform. As it pertains to moving the needle in these negotiations, I would be very careful about actually believing we have that high card. Nobody wins. Nobody has a high card. We're the debtor nation here. They're the creditor. We can play hard and gain advantages, but I think ultimately we've seen the way the markets responded. Yes, we're up a lot today. We're not even back to where we were Thursday. Right. The president needs to be careful in this midterm year around the trade stuff, and I think he will be. Yeah, you know, but, but by the same token, though, Bob, um, you know, if, if China says, hey, we're not going to force you to go into joint ventures where we uh, openly steal all your intellectual property, or we're, we're going to buy more semiconductors from you, and we're going to uh, give greater access to our markets, mathematically, it won't be $100 billion, but it will be something. Something is so much better than what we have been getting uh, thus far. <clears throat> Yeah, that's right, Charles. I mean, President Trump on the campaign trail, he said, listen, I, I'm not anti-trade. I just want better deals. And I think he's in the process of maybe not getting the best deal because everyone's got to win. A trade war makes no sense for either side. I totally agree with that. Uh, but this also has to get the attention of Canada and Mexico because this could be his big deal, trade uh, on NAFTA and renegotiating NAFTA, which is something President Obama promised on the campaign trail. But when he became president, abandoned, uh, Trump is, is following through on these trade promises he made. 
And, and Harry, uh, you know what? Uh, I, I, for me, as far as the market being a gauge, uh, you know, I look at it two different ways. I, I don't always think that the market is a great reflection of Main Street. You know, we could see a company say we're laying off 2,000 workers and their stock goes up. Bad news for Main Street, great news for Wall Street. General Motors exports cars out of China. Great news for General Motors, great news for, for their shareholders, and great news for the Chinese factory worker. Not great news for the American who didn't make the car. So if the president can get through this and, and really live up to this promise, I think that's momentum going into the midterm elections. I do. And I think what the president needs to hammer next is he needs to take the Chinese to the WTO on all the subsidies that they provide to all their, their local and, and big businesses. There's a plan they have called Made in China 2025 that actually gives Chinese businesses hundreds of billions of dollars in subsidies. So the president needs to take this approach on, on free and reciprocal trade and start talking about the other ways the Chinese cheat, which are attuned to much bigger damages to, to U.S. companies. And U.S. companies are actually trying to get into the Chinese market. It's actually a much bigger problem than what we realized. Yeah, I know in January, uh, the administration did a lot on counter, uh, countervailing duties and, and some other approaches with the World Trade Center, uh, World Trade Organization. Hey, guys, listen, let's listen to what Steven Mnuchin had to say, and then I'll come to you, David. We are going to pr proceed with our tariffs. We're working on that. We're also working on investment restrictions. But we're simultaneously having negotiations with the Chinese to see if we can reach an agreement. So as President Trump said, we're not afraid of a trade war, but that's not our objective. So is, is, uh, ultimately, isn't that the right approach? I think that having an approach that allows for tough negotiation and having actions, Charles, that actually punish the wrongdoer, that's the problem I have on the tariff side. I don't disagree with the premises that China's misbehaving in these different cases. I disagree with punishing American consumers for what China's doing. I, Ultimately, I think that they're probably going to get to mostly the right place. I don't think there will be as much teeth in the tariff side of it, especially the way we've seen the steel and aluminum side play out. But your point's a very important one when you say there's often a disconnect between Main Street and the stock market. However, Charles, I'd be very careful in the midterm year when so much of his claim around the, ben the growing economy, which is valid, it's right, the economy is healthy, but if there isn't any measurement of it, the stock market is the area where people have been right. feeling <clears throat> it. We know that because the president said so although, 600 al although, times. Although the mainstream so media I think is quick, that he has to balance all these things. The mainstream media is quick to say that over half of America Americans don't have money in the stock market. If we can say, hey, GDP is at a certain level, jobs are at a certain level, and I think the market will be there too. Ford, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right. You asked the question, what would be a political victory for Donald Trump? And I think that is opening up the Chinese markets to more U.S. products, whether they're consumer and financial, particularly on automobiles and semiconductors. The key for Donald Trump in holding the House in 2018, to your point, not so much about the stock market, but making workers believe that you're putting them first, you're going to look for more jobs. Because if we open those markets up to more U.S. products, that means more jobs at home. And for Trump, it's all about jobs, jobs, and jobs. Gentlemen, thank you all very much for your expertise and your passion.